Welcome back to Behind the Madness, where we talk about business growth, ways to work smarter, and the fundamentals of business, all geared to unlocking your brand's peak performance. I'm your host, James Roberts, owner and founder of Method, and today I'm joined by Sean from HubSpot. We're going to talk over some of the ways that HubSpot are approaching sales and extract some tips from Sean that will help you lift your sales game. But before I jump in, I wanted to let you know about ways that you can contact the show. We have some great content and helpful tips currently going out on Instagram, which is probably one of the best places to find us. That is at hello underscore method. But we've also introduced a new email podcast at hellomethod.co.uk where you can give us any feedback or ask any questions that we will try and answer on future episodes. So let's jump in on today's episode. How to up your sales game and top tips from inside HubSpot. So welcome to Behind the Madness, Sean. Hi, James. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, hope you're no well today. At all. Yeah, very well. Very well. The, the hot weather's passed us by, which is making it a lot easier. Yeah. Let's start with a bit of background around you and your role at HubSpot then, Sean. Yeah. So, so we've been taking it before that. So I um, have been working in, in the tech industry in Dublin for about 16 years now which makes me feel very old saying that, um, <laughs> but, but it's the truth. So I spent like 10 years in a um, pretty large uh, Oracle, which would be a pretty large enterprise type company. Um, and then I moved on from Oracle to a startup called Datadog, um, where I spent about three years. It was an exciting role, um, again, in Dublin, like where I was one of the first employees. So very, very different to uh, my experiences in Oracle. And then since then, I am um, for the last up, coming up to two years in September, I've been working in HubSpot. So my, my role in HubSpot would be um, a channel account manager. So well, what is a channel account manager? So essentially, I work with a book of partners, um, roughly around 15 of them. And my role is to help them kind of getting in the right kind of sales processes in place, making sure like obviously I'm connecting them to the right people in HubSpot when they are working those deals. But like making sure they're going in, pitching HubSpot correctly, have an understanding of all our products and offerings and kind of supporting them essentially in terms of building their pipeline and working with them collaboratively on deals together as well. So essentially, like that's pretty much like a kind of a high overview of, of my role within HubSpot and obviously my previous experience as well. Perfect. So yeah, as Sean says, he's our, uh, he's our cam which is, uh, as he says, a channel account manager and keeps the pressure on us and also an amazing resource that all partners within HubSpot kind of do get, um, which is ideal. So, Sean, I've always had in my head that uh, with any of these big kind of American organizations and their sales teams, it's all kind of baseballs in hand, it's headsets on, and it's ringing bells kind of when all those deals are closed, all the high fives around the office. How does that can kind of compare to to HubSpot? How does that relate? I, I genuinely say it's like chalk and cheese. Like, so I, I think a lot of people like in here, you watch films like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross and all those kind of like old school sales films. And that's like the impression a lot of people have, like where you're, as you alluded to there earlier on, ringing bells and kind of things. So it's a very, very different environment. Like, and like HubSpot really kind of pride themselves in terms of, of the environment they create for their employees as well. So like it's very structured, like and your management and the rest of your team really do give you support, making sure that like we work together as a team. And, and I mentioned collaboration with our partners, but it very much is a collaboration kind of internally within HubSpot as well. Whereas like we really work together as a team with the common objective, like is what HubSpot's motto is, we want to help businesses grow. Um, and, and that's our main objective. And like, uh, we we not, we're certainly not a pushy organization either. Like while while we're massively growing consistently, nearly doubling our customer base every year, like it, wow. it's very much about going in there and understanding the customers' needs as opposed to pushing these products kind of on them. Going oh, let's buy marketing professional, for example, or sales professional or enterprise. Like it, it's about understanding their needs, their challenges, and really delving into that. And as opposed to pushing a solution on them. What HubSpot like to do would be really to kind of then tailor a kind of demonstration or, or a presentation like to their specific requirements as opposed to going, this is what we can do, we're great. Like, so I think kind of back to kind of your original point as well, James, like I think sales in general, particularly as we've moved to the world of SaaS cloud, 
like it, it is very much changed and like it's a competitive market out there as well like so we really need to start kind of like understanding the customer's needs and i think that's one of the best changes i've seen in my kind of time within sales like now it's really about helping the customers with their issues as opposed to telling them like what they need yeah, to do yeah. like so i, I hope that answers so your helping, question not anyway. selling yeah exactly yeah 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 and, and i think it's kind of what we've always done in terms of what we do as an organization is is kind of the similar which i think is why we were so nicely aligned to hubspot when we when we did join um but yeah it does come back to you are you're helping your customers you're helping them and you're not selling to them i think there was an old analogy where if you were uh turning up many years ago with your car and you had the brush you could turn up with this broom and say this is the best broom in the world yeah. and there was kind of no no one else to kind of question it whereas now obviously in the world that we're living in um you've got all of the comments you've got feedback you've got testimonials and it, you can be very quickly found out if you are just trying to to kind of get that that quick win um so yeah i think you know helping people uh, and, and, and aligning, as you said, exactly uh, aligning their needs to your offering, I think really works well. Absolutely. So obviously you, you say, obviously it's about this team collaboration. How does that, how does that work in the office? How, what's your kind of day to day look like? How's your typical day pan out? Yeah. So, so what I typically go in using, like, obviously I work for HubSpot, so using a lot of the HubSpot tools that, that are in place, I would go in, have a look at my tasks. Like, so that's the first thing I would block off my calendar and I do think a very important kind of part of, of any kind of salesperson's role is to be able to manage your calendar so what what, why I, what I mean by that is like kind of blocking off times like where you're going to do certain activities as well like so I would spend the first hour even hour and a half sun morning like catching up with my tasks that I would have set in like our, our HubSpot CRM system making sure I'm actioning all of them as well um, so they're their follow-ups, their email people, all of the all of the kind of reminders as you said that you're getting from all of the tools. Exactly. Like there might be cool. like I might have had a call like with a prospect yeah, yesterday, for example. Like so making sure that I have a task set to send that follow-up email, like with clear next steps and agendas and all that kind of good stuff within the emails. Um and then like what one of the, the important part is kind of as well, kind of going into my pipeline. Typically I'd go in have a look at my what my pipeline is like for the month, understand where the deals are within the sales process. What do I need to do to get those deals to the next step? Like, so it might be you just had a discovery call with someone, for example, like how am I going to bring that deal on to, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, onto solution presentation? Um, usually what I like to do, and as, as I mentioned at the start of the call, like part of my role would be like as a channel account manager. So I would spend a lot of time strategizing with my partners like yourself, James, as well, like where we would go in and kind of focus on kind of number one, like where can I support you in the deal process? How can we go in and build more pipeline for yourselves? Like understanding like and I basically have partners at like very different levels. Like so HubSpot have a process. You'd have an untiered partner, a gold, a platinum, a diamond and a lease. And I, I have partners at every kind of tier that it is within HubSpot as well so like your elite partners for example like will be very self-sufficient but like still like they need to be kind of speaking to more direct they're growing their pipeline where I would have new partners on and like I'm basically bringing them through like the like 101 of sales some are coming in like from a marketing background they haven't really sold for so I'm helping them kind of gap uh, fill in some of the gaps in terms of upskilling them or, or providing them with content that's obviously going to to make them like for example a, a small example of that something like i would give a good like discovery question list to kind of some of my uh partners as well to go this is how you should structure your kind of discovery call or, or something along those lines anyway but um so i suppose yeah as you said people will come in from those different levels where they've had they've had no processes in place they've had nothing kind of set they're doing it very ad hoc they've not even probably had the hubspot tools it's probably those partners are probably coming in and and learning all these tools as well and they've had uh, you know they're probably doing it from referrals they're doing it from emails that are coming in from their from their uh, from their contacts or, or potential leads but there's been no set processes i guess so do so is that something that you would focus on a lot uh, outlining processes that you can work with that you can work with these partners and work with yourselves really yeah no absolutely and what i would say there is like for for any company no matter how big or how small you are like 
the, one of the most important things is having a defined sales process in place. Like, so that, that is really important to me. Like, so well, why is it important to have like a sales process in place? So like, it's really like for, for your prospects, like ha showing clear next steps kind of, and it really builds certainty for you and your company as well. Like, so it's basically able to show like that you are controlling the sales process. And as a lot of people like are coming under the impression that the buyer wants to kind of control the sales process, but they want assurance of the kind of the seller uh, for want of a better word, like kind of to be able to go in there and show them that like, you've got a clear kind of structured kind of process in terms you've done this before. A lot of times like the buyer may not have had any kind of like sales or buying experience as well. Like, so mm -hmm. you're giving them that assurance that like, I'm here, I've done this before. We've done it with similar companies like you. So we know as well, like what it also kind of allows um, the, the salesperson to do is kind of, it's able to really kind of manage your own timelines and, and your forecasting. Mm -hmm. Like, like it really keeps your offering kind of at the top of an agenda as well. Like, and kind of, and it really like lowers kind of your chances of like a prospect ghosting you as well. Like, and what, what I mean by that as well is like, if you're constantly kind of, as I mentioned earlier on, I'd make sure I'm sending the follow-up emails to the prospect, outlining what we've discussed and clearly outlining kind of what we would basically um, like to kind of go through on our next call as well. Like, so it kind of brings me on to a couple of things as well that like I would feel very important as part of the sales process. Always have an upfront agreement. Like, so when you get onto a call, like, really go in and kind of go, why are we on this call today? Like, so like, I, I don't know, like kind of like an, an example, I suppose, of something like that would be going like, look, today we have 45 minutes scheduled for a call uh, to determine if HubSpot is a good fit for your business. Like, does that time still work for you? And naturally, like you'll have questions about HubSpot and the tool itself and the pricing. So that's obviously telling them what they're hoping to get out of it. Yin, you'd go something like, I would like to understand the structure of the business, your decision-making process, your current strategy, um, before going into kind of a presentation, does that work for you? So always kind of going back and like asking them the question on it. And then like, I'd say something like typically like the next steps would be kind of to provide if we are a good fit, we to schedule a more tailored presentation. Like, um, so some of the concerns that I have would be kind of not having clear next steps in place by the end of the call. Um, so what we should do at five minutes at the end of the call is discuss what we've gone through today and and basically kind of going, this is what I understand them saying, kind of getting their clarification like all the way through that process as well. So you're um, summarizing kind of as you go it, through it and all and, and at the end kind of getting their, their, their uh, confirming that that they're understanding it right, I guess. As yeah, well. getting their buy-in as well, like James, like is very important. It's like, so just like always getting their buy-in and their feedback. Like, well, what I would say, like, and if we were just seeking specifically, I suppose, a bit of discovery call, like that, you're trying to understand their business. It's always kind of, I'd say, a rule of thumb is kind of getting them speaking kind of eighty percent of the time, and you speaking mm -hmm. kind of twenty percent of the time. And like, well, that's important because number one you're going to get a lot more information from them if they're speaking all the time. Um, and, and also, like, if we're just telling them about how great HubSpot are or whatever your product is, like, you're, you're, you're positioning to the prospect, like, they don't want to hear how great you are, like, and I can do this and we can do everything for you. When they're speaking, like, and, and it's really easy sometimes to do. And, like, what I would say is just make sure you're asking open-ended questions, like, and... Like, and there's simple, like easy things go, why is that important to you? Like, what, have you tried to fix this before? Like, what obstacles have you come up against? Like, it's like, obviously you can't keep them going, why, but why, but why? Like, does it become a little bit robotic, to be honest with you? But it, it, it is very much kind of following up. And like, again, going back to like the kind of rule of thumb that I would use would be that usually you ask a question, like, and then if you go, why is that important? There's something or phrase that like I describe why this is like important. It's usually when they start speaking after the third question that you're really, really getting into those kind of pains, I suppose. Like, and it's like the five whys, isn't it? From is it Toyota had the five, the five whys. That's right. Yeah, do, yeah. Do you find that takes a lot of practice? And I'm guessing the flip side to that question as well is, do you also work with script so you've got something to help you along as you're going through all these but then also yeah does it take a lot of practice and time to kind of get that 
those open ears, as it were, rather than open mouths. Well, yeah, so, so I suppose going back to the early days in my kind of sales career, like I kind of lived by kind of having those scripts, like, and like I'd have like certain questions like that I'd always ask, like, oh, like straight away going and tell me about your business. Like, how do you make money? What are your challenges like and all? And I'd have a list of questions I'd ask, like to define timelines, budget. Am I speaking to a decision maker? And obviously going into those kind of pain questions as well. But like, I, I wouldn't really use my scripts um, anymore myself, but I definitely suggest like for newer people, people coming into sales, like to definitely like have that structure. Now you don't want to be like reading like every question nice. of a script. And like a lot of the times what you'll find is like it, your line of questioning, like would be very, you'll get a very different answer all the time. Like, so you have to go with what kind of what what your prospect is saying to you, and, and that'll be kind of really when you delve into it. So, in, in I suppose the short answer is yes. Initially, I would have those scripts, and eventually, what will happen is like those questions will really become second nature to you as well. Like in terms of what you're saying, I suppose it helps in the early days. Certainly, I know we did it through Dan Tyre's uh, sales boot camp, his Lions boot camp, and having those scripts to kind of hand were off the first few calls, which, you know, for, for, if you bear in mind, a lot of people who are going to be listening to this are going to be, uh, they're not going to be doing the calls. They're not going to be doing all of those things where it can be really scary to just pick up the phone and speak to somebody from the first time. And having those to kind of hand was quite helpful. But over time, exactly as you said, you learn to kind of just use them as a maybe a prompt if you need certain questions but really listen to what that prospect's saying to you on the phone and, and tailor it that way. Um, but I also love the idea of, of summarizing and getting their buy-in yeah. at the end, but also defining out, and it's something we do all the time now, is you know if you've got 15 minutes carved out for a call, you stick to that 15 minutes and you know you let them know that you're coming up to the 15 minutes, there's something on, and you really, it really starts to focus those calls down to what you need. Um, one thing as well with the sales process, and I don't know whether this is something that you guys do, was we will always try and get the next process or the next step booked in before we kind of get off that call. So as we're talking to somebody, we're very much right. This is what we're going to do. This is what the next thing is going to be. How's your, how's your calendar looking for Wednesday next week? So we, we've already, it makes it harder to get out, as it were, yeah. but, but also you're getting that confirmation, I guess, as you're going. Is that something that you, you guys do as well? Yeah, and I, I genuinely, that was the next thing I was going to go on to as well. Like, so well, I, I've discussed already about kind of probably three kind of key steps in controlling a sales process. And what I mentioned was having that open agreement and really understanding that pain and asking those open-ended questions. And like you hit the nail on the head there as well, James, in terms of like having those next steps. And like, that, and that's probably something I didn't do earlier on in my kind of my sales career was very much kind of left it to them to cancel and, and or to kind of contact us like and as a result a lot of my deals went to close loss as well but like and it goes back to controlling that sales process again like so unless you're kind of qualifying out make sure you have a mutual agreed kind of next step in place like so you want to go right so what we like kind of re kind of go through like summarize basically what we've discussed today so We've covered this from my understanding, your three main, like, and usually I try to get three main kind of like little bullet points going. We've discussed, for example, you're not getting enough marketing leads. Um, you, you've nowhere to kind of report on this or um, you, you have no way of sending out kind of mass emails or something. Is that fair enough? Again, get their agreements and then go. So what I would like to do as a next step now um, is kind of, arrange a tailored demonstration to those specific requirements. Does that sound good to you? Yes. Um, so, and then really kind of getting that. And I always get that time in the calendar when I'm on that call as well. I don't wait around. I, I would get that meeting in going, are you free next Wednesday at three o'clock? And they might say another time, but making sure you're actually getting it in their calendar from then. Understanding. I suppose it saves, it saves a couple of things as well, Sean, doesn't it? Surely that when it's taking off your plate, you don't have to remember to do anything after the call you've got it all tied up nicely yeah within that call so as soon as, the, as soon as you hang up the phone there's no nothing for you really to do because you've got the next call booked in so you don't have to worry about all that time wasted of trying to chase somebody but what was really interesting i think what you said was when you were leaving it up to them you were losing more deals or you weren't closing as many deals when it was because and, and what was that was that just 
drifting because the time was drifting on because you were waiting on them, waiting on them, waiting on them. By the time you finally got back to them, they were already had solutions in place. How 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 kind of that correlate yeah like so like a, a few things really like so maybe they just left it like and there was an expectation that i was following up on it mm. maybe they're speaking with other vendors and, and they're further down the line with those other vendors and they might go well sean never even bothered getting back to us like i'm speaking to salesforce or whoever the other vendor is mm. like and going well they they're because they're certainly doing it as well like but um yeah, like it really is kind of like going back to controlling that sales process as well. Like it, it, it basically like shows you that like or shows them like as you as the kind of the seller in, in this instance, like are really kind of in control. You understand their needs as well. Like and you, you have like kind of position something like going, we will be able to do this kind of in the next step as well. So it just shows, uh, I suppose, an air of competency, like when you have those in place and when I didn't do it years ago, like like a lot of deals, some would get back to you, but for the most part, like like a lot of them weren't getting back to me. Like and like again, it goes back to kind of your question, kind of original question, and what do I do on a day to day basis? That's why it's important to have those tasks as well. Like because if you don't have that structure and you're not setting that time aside, you you can be a bit all over the place from a sales perspective as well. So you can be very much kind of going in going oh i never sent them the email oh i missed that as well like so it, a lot of it, like being a successful salesperson is about having structure kind of in your day-to-day -day routines in like everything you do like should be all kind of taught out like and timed and all as well like so i, I think that is very important I, I hope that answers your question i wasn't yeah wasn't I think, I think from our point of view i mean obviously we've got uh, we're a little bit bigger now so we've got andy who helps out with with the sales front but when it was all falling on me I'm obviously trying to do the day job. I'm trying to do a number of other different things. And without, if it, were, if it was leaving it up to me, it wouldn't happen. Uh, whereas I had, that's why I have to have these reminders. I have to have the tasks. Um, and I have to have that, that prompt of somebody just telling me, telling me to kind of, to do it. I think also what coming back to somebody who's outlined a sales process and you're, you, you kind of kept mentioning that, you know, you want to make them feel that you are in control and that you, know, you almost know what you're doing, which I think then certainly from what we do reflects well, when, if you were taking them through a sales journey and you've got a nice process that you are doing with that, with that prospect, it almost makes them feel comfortable that when they do work with you, obviously it's slightly different with a SaaS based company, but when they're dealing with us, we're still dealing with them and looking after them in terms of their jobs and their requirements and their needs. And if you've laid out something with a good process through sales, then they're going to feel more comfortable about doing the actual work with you because you're actually going to look after them and do those same processes, obviously different, but with them when they're actual customers. So I think that's a really, really good point of outlining. How, how long are the processes? How long, and obviously it's going to depend massively on, on the organization and the, uh, the, the verticals that those organizations are in, but how, how long does, do, do those processes take? would you say generally speaking yeah like like it's a good question like in, in some ways you could say like how long's a piece of string like because every kind of sales process can be different so i, I suppose like a typical hubspot sales process where they'd be buying kind of let's say marketing professional or sales professional we, we would typically say about four to six weeks that sales process mm -hmm. would, would be and like what it basically would be like would be as i mentioned we'd have that initial like 30 minute call or introducing ourselves then what we would bring it into is into that deeper kind of discovery call and um, the next steps would be more than likely a kind of solution presentation then like, probably we'd set up another call like um that we'd kind of like discuss the pricing like how this is going to look like bringing in kind of yourself a partner like yourself james like to onboard them as well like so and, and look that that'd be, that's a dream sales process like like it all depends. There might be like a, a far more complex deal, like where they might need multiple integrations or mm -hmm. they, they might like have different kind of systems they're using and like they have to know how these will work together. Like, so like a sales process, I've had sales processes that have taken kind of six, seven months, or even some that have taken up to a year. Um, obviously you're going to invest more time in a bigger deal as well. And there's probably mm -hmm. a few more steps involved, but what I do think and what's really worked well for me in terms of controlling that is having a kind of mutual action plan and what i mean by a mutual action plan is like it's a document like an excel sheet that i've set up like and document like and nearly you go into these things and work backwards so going what date do you want your decision made by like so we want to 
be up and live and running on our systems by September the 30th in 2022. So, all right, we're four months. What has to happen, like, in that kind of process yes. in order to yep. get us there? Like, and, and again, and this is a document I would share with the clients. And I found kind of the time in terms of my opportunities I'm working on have kind of reduced uh, reduce massively because, like, I'm controlling the sales process as well. And I'm cladding out all those clear steps. Like oh, some of the things I mentioned that happens in the sales process, but they might go, oh, I have to have an internal call with the board, for example. But documenting all that, when is that actually going to take place? It's going to take place on the 3rd of August. Okay, so why don't we put something on our calendars? You have that meeting on the 3rd of August. We'll have a catch up on 4th of August to see how it's going. Like, but so it gives you, and like, if you, if you have a manager, like I sit down with my manager, like, and we do forecast reviews, like, and I don't bring up this document. So this is when they want to make a decision. This is everything that we are aware that has to happen as well. Like, and like when it really works well, like these mutual action plans is when they, like, it could be shared with multiple people in the organization mm -hmm. you're prospecting to, um, and they're updating all the fields going, oh, we have to do this and what we have. And then, then, you know, you're in a really good place with a deal as well, like, because you kind of know, okay, we've got key stakeholders in here. They're buying into this process as well. Like, so, like, so to answer your original question, I suppose, like, how long is the sales process? It could be anything, depending on your offer. You could sell something in two days. But I suppose my point I'm trying to get at really is kind of going, you can control that process as well. And by having those activity plans, by always putting next steps in place, by kind of getting their buy-in because like what another really part of it as well is kind of what we would call getting a champion in a company and what a champion is in a company is someone that like is selling for you internally like so typically like i'd be speaking for a marketing side, manager yeah. if they're, they're buying kind of our marketing hub like and a lot of the times hubspot is probably you, you know james is is the best marketing tool out there in the market like so a lot of times they want hubspot but the CEO go, I don't care what you want as well. Like, but you, you, you want to make sure that like you're giving her like, or him all the right materials, like in there to kind of go, okay, well, what do you need in order to get this across the line? Like, and, and in terms of material there, what are you, what are you kind of giving out? Is that blog stories? It's articles, it's videos, it's whatever relates to that need of, let's say that marketing manager then to provide it to their stakeholders or their bosses to convince them. Exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. it could be any of those. What, what I do a lot of the times actually is do a little like, now I don't do a, a 50 page deck like or slides, anything like that, but I would give kind of four or five slides to, to that person, like, and basically go in and kind of go on, like, what are the challenges we have? Like, so they're sitting in like with, with their CEO or CFO or whoever their, uh, their board members or uh, exec level people are. And then clearly going, these are the challenges we have. This is how HubSpot can fix it. Um, and then really kind of just showing like where we can add value. Maybe po I might even put in a case study like of, of a relevant organization like to them, like in the same industry, the same size or something like that, where we can actually go in and uh, go, right, we've worked with companies like yours before. So I, I think that has worked really well for me in terms of having that little deck like kind of to your kind of the champion like. Um, and, and I do think it's very important to have a champion, like in all your kind of buying processes, like and really working closely with them. But then what that will happen as well is like they will be happy to introduce you to other key stakeholders as well, like your your CFOs, your chief revenue officers, your CEOs, like if they get involved in the process as well, like but that's when, you know, you have a really good champion, too. Yeah, perfect. When they're including you. Right. To kind of bring this to a little bit of a close, and I think we've covered um loads um we might have to get you back on sean and, and kind of deep dive into some of these some of the points that we've raised yeah. but kind of as a, a little bit of a closing question what would you be your top tips for kind of anybody uh working in sales who kind of want to improve their game yeah like it, it's a good question as well like and like there's so many things i could say here as well like so what, what what's like i find initially kind of like in when i was in my early sales days as well like is kind of understanding like don't have happy years don't be listening kind of to down oh yeah they need marketing and oh or they need a sales tool or a service tool or, or whatever product you're selling like and going oh yeah that's great and like we, we're like have that like so we're gonna win like like i really try to identify why they won't buy like and, and that's mm -hmm. really important like and 
So asking questions like stuff like, why will you not move forward with us? Like, have you ever done this before? Tell me about your process. Like who else is involved in the decision-making process? I, do they want anything like, or is it just you like, and all like, and like what objections do you think your colleagues would have? Like, can you think of three reasons why this won't be approved? Like, and look, they might seem like negative questions, but like if you've identified all of them as part of the process, like you, you, and the, the worst thing to do is get dragged along in a sales process. And look, I think everybody has been guilty of doing that at some stage or another where you're going, I think they want to buy, I think they want to buy, but like yeah, you probably yeah. haven't asked those hard questions. And like what that will do is like, there's no, there's nothing wrong with qualifying out of an opportunity. Like, and I think like more junior salespeople like are afraid to qualify out, ask those hard questions. Like, but like, it's your time. Like your time is just as important as the, as the prospect's time as well. And, and you have to realize that like, you don't pander to kind of what they want and like letting them, as I mentioned, controlling a sales process. You be selfish with your time as well and be prepared to qualify out as well. Like, and like there's a kind of like asking those questions. It doesn't say like shy kids don't get the candy. Have <laughs> I heard before? Like, so <laughs> like what, what I mean by that and how it relates to what I'm saying as well as going out. If you're not asking those tough questions, like, um, that like, what, why are we, what, why are you in it? Like, you really have to know that as well. So, so that's one point. Um, like, two things are probably going back on some of the other stuff I mentioned earlier on, like, and not for want of being kind of repetitive, but like, I can't stress how important it really is as part of the, the sales process to kind of have that upfront agreement in place, really outlining from the call. Again, this shows control going like, kind of, what are we going to cover today? how I'm going to help you, what, what I need to understand from you as well. Um, and having those clear steps in terms of what we're going to cover, having those, and look, as I mentioned earlier on, there's no harm having kind of like a scripted questions as well, initially in your call, but like really having those, how am I going to delve into this pain, asking open-ended questions, making sure they're uh, kind of speaking the majority. If you're kind of speaking a lot more than them, I genuinely think like there, there could be a problem there because you want to be hearing them like kind of speaking and going through their challenges because there, there's an emotional side of it as well for them. Like, because number one, they don't want to lose face in the company, like as in like, oh, I don't want to bring this poor product in, like, or I don't want to kind of make this investment that doesn't work. But they want to kind of come off and show like, I've made this business better by bringing in whatever tool or, or whatever product or feature like that, that the, the seller is offering as well. Like next steps as well. Next steps, like is another kind of point I certainly would kind of really reiterate in terms of going through kind of having that plan in place, getting something in the calendar, understanding who the attendees are going to be, getting a time, a date, getting that meet and link out. Like sounds simplistic stuff like, but I can guarantee you a lot of people don't do that in the kind of the sales process as well. Like, and yeah, so that's pretty much most of the things I can think of off the top of my head. I think that was five anyway, James. I'm not, yeah, no, not that's brilliant. Absolutely sure. brilliant. Yeah, no, it was good enough. It was good enough. I think you're right. I think every point that you've kind of raised opens up another avenue which we can delve into. And as I mentioned before, it'd be great to kind of have you on in another episode where we can really pick on a subject. Obviously, covering sales, as we know, yeah. as we found out, is is a big old subject. But I think, as you said, having those strategies in place. So, Sean, thanks so much for today. It has been amazing. As we said, we've covered some uh, some great topics uh, and also got a little bit of insight into HubSpot and the, the fact that you're not ringing bells and you're also working as, a, <laughs> working as a team, which I think is much better. So thanks for your time today, Sean. Thanks for having me on, James. Really appreciate it. No problem. So if you've enjoyed this podcast, make sure you subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen. Remember, you can always drop any comments directly to us on our email podcast at hellomethod.co.uk. That's it for ep this episode. So thanks for listening and we'll catch you next time.